All right, so I'm going to talk about some of the production costs and the net returns, and then if we have more time, I'll talk about um, some applied research on looking at cover crops and supplemental nitrogen, if we have enough time for that. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started talking about changes to inputs. In general, for the next year, fertilizer prices are going to be down, and it's quite a bit from different than last year. Uh, we're expecting nitrogen prices to be about 55 cents a pound, where last year it was about 70 cents. Uh, phosphorus, 40 cents for this next year compared to 55 last year. And potassium, 45 cents compared to 50 cents last year. As far as chemical prices, those are mixed in terms of up and down. It depends on the chemical that you use, whether it's going to be more expensive than last year or less expensive. So those are a mixed bag. And then in terms of machinery prices, we're seeing an increase in those. Implements about 1.5% higher in tractors and self-propelled equipment, about 3% higher. Now, I wanted to talk to you about farm diesel prices, and I guess, because this is dead, I don't have a laser. Oh, I do have a laser. All right, so I wanted to show you some average prices for the past four years and projections for the next two years. And this is based on the um, Energy Information Administration's short-term energy outlook for diesel prices, and then I took out the um, the taxes to make it the farm diesel prices. And you can see 2010 we had an average price of 275 a gallon, 2011 360 went up 2012 to 373 and then last year we saw it come down a little bit to 368 a gallon. They're expecting 2014 to be down again and 2015 to be down even more from that. And that's because they see that there's more supplies from a global standpoint. And domestically, we have access to more petroleum through various means like fracking and all of that. So I wanted to show you those. Um, but the main thing that I want to get from this is that there are there is some seasonality in terms of diesel fuel prices, as you can see from the curves here. And so I put together, last year I created a seasonal index for farm diesel prices. So you can kind of see what month is the best time to buy diesel. Well, of course I had to update it with 2013 information. And I took 2009 out because, of course, you know it's an older year. But in terms of the trend, in terms of seasonality of the diesel prices, it wasn't really consistent. Um, 2008 price went like that and 2009 it really kind of just went it went up until about 2010 so this next slide is showing our monthly price index for diesel fuel so 100 is basically the average price for the year so 2014 I think we're looking at about 360 a gallon for 2014 so if that is correct, as far as the Energy Information Administration's projections, the average price for 2014 will be $3.60. Now, January, based on the index, and February, January's price is about 5.4% lower than the year's average price, and February's is about 2% lower than the year's average price. So, January would average out to a price of about $3.40 to a gallon or so. Um, so January and February, based on the trends uh, from data 2010 through 2013, these two months are ideal months to purchase diesel if you can go ahead and purchase it and store it on your farm. But if you don't have enough storage for all year, June, July, and August are also below average in terms of prices, so those are good times to purchase before harvest and so on. So based on that data, January and February, June, July, and August are really the ideal times to purchase diesel fuel where it's going to be higher in March, April, May, September, October, November, December. So any questions on that or how it's interpreted? Your local county agents will have access to this um, slide. I've going, I'm going to make sure that they have access to it if you need to refer to it later on. 
but lower diesel and fertilizer prices do not mean more profits. Um, as Don alluded to, commodity prices are down, so margins are going to be tighter. And now I want to take a look at the crop comparison tool. <coughs> the big things as far as changes that we've done in terms of comparing cotton to the other crops is we've adjusted the yields for peanuts for irrigated and dry land. We bumped them up another 200 pounds. And we also changed the machinery and equipment on the harvesting of peanuts from four row, four row equipment to six row equipment. We conducted a survey last fall and it just showed that there was more farmers using six row harvest equipment, so we wanted to update that and make it more reflective of what typical operations are. So because of that economy of scale advantage, the harvesting costs for peanuts are less than what they were, what they appeared to be last year in the four row harvest budgets. Um, the prices, I, I know it says expected season average price, I, I should change that. They're actually the harvest time futures adjusted for basis um, as of early January, except for peanuts of course, um, that's kind of what an expectation of, of contracts may be. We know that contracts I think were sent out for 425 earlier this year, um, but there was a premium for high oleic peanuts, so we've got it at 440 in the budget right now. So let me move it down. Again, we don't have land rent in there, but if you want to put that value in, you can. And when you're making your planning decisions, this is what you want to look at, that first yellow row. The ability to cover your seed, fuel, fertilizer, all of those operating expenses. You want to be able to cover those with whichever price that you forward contract at um, and the expected yield that you hope to obtain. We still have the ability to adjust fertilizer and diesel fuel prices at the bottom in the footnotes if you want to change those. <coughs> One thing that has been of interest this year is the ability to make the price comparisons and we have the price comparison charts still available if we want to compare say peanuts to cotton. Ooh, I need to zoom out on that one. Based on the budgeted yields and the budgeted costs that we have on that front page, these are the competitive prices to have equal returns above operating expenses. So if cotton is at 78 cents, then we'll need 410 for dryland peanuts and 446 for irrigated peanuts to compete with 1,200 pound irrigated cotton and 750 pound dry land cotton. <coughs> Any questions on the crop comparison tool or would anybody like to see some changes to yield or price? <coughs> Those of you in here that are uh, Georgia producers, uh, just for our information, do you think the 750 on non-irrigated cotton and the 1,200 pounds <coughs> irrigated, do you think those are reasonable levels? Not too low, not too optimistic? Um, Y'all think those are good numbers for us to be using? We used to have 1,100 on irrigated cotton, but uh, we upped it to 1,200 based on some pretty good years that we were having and uh, some feedback that we got from growers. I've been, we've been tempted to increase the non-irrigated yield from 750 up to 800, but again, I talked to a lot of, a lot of growers that say that just 750 is still pushing it for them in some areas and uh, 800 would just be pushing it even more. But again, we got some folks that don't have a 
don't have too much difficulty making eight hundred or better on on dry land. But just kind of typical where it's seven fifty and twelve hundred, and I didn't know if y'all thought that was those were still good levels to use or not. Any feedback or comments you want to give us, we we appreciate it because, like like Amanda said, we try to try to get these as close to realistic as we possibly can. Is this on a statewide basis, uh, like average yield. Uh, well, I mean, it's it's mostly South Georgia, but I think cotton's a little more statewide. The other ones are mostly South Georgia: the corn, soybeans, sorghum, wheat. Peanuts or South Georgia. Any other questions, comments? I think I will try to put it on four pages rather than two next time just to make it easier to see. Can we access this information on Yes. Your county agents have the links, and my very last slide, I've actually got the link to where you can find it online, too. Yes, and that, that is the neat thing about it, is you can download the spreadsheet on your own computer and adjust the numbers um, as far as your management practices, what you booked your fertilizer, diesel fuel at, all of that. You can adjust it, change the yields and so on and there's some cells that are protected right now I had it unprotected to change it but if they're tied to yield like say the ginning and warehouse I think it's protected yeah so because right up here it's a complex formula so if you don't want to um, delete that formula then you're, you're safe, but all you have to do to unprotect it is just go to unprotect sheet. If you know what your ginning and warehousing is ex expected to be. No password on it, no. All of the costs in here, I mean, you can go in and change, and we'd be happy to do that. You can change any of the yields and prices and costs that you want to. On the mm -hmm. cost, for example, if you look on cotton, on herbicides, if it says, 60 bucks or it may it probably it's got all the chemicals grouped in together yeah it does so that's everything from pgrs to defoliant and weed control and everything lumped in together but you know if you want to know where that where the individual cost numbers came from you'll have to load up the individual budget and look at that you know load up the corn budget the cotton budget peanuts whatever see see what assumptions and see what we're using to come up with that number and that might help you to, to <coughs> know how to adjust it up or, up or down. Yes, Rodney. Amanda, if you change that price on the irrigated cotton to 80 cents, how, how would that compare with the peanuts? The return of a variable cost for cotton at 1,200 pounds would be 425 an acre, and peanuts 4,700 pounds at 440 a ton would be 382. So there appears to be an advantage to cotton at 80 cents a pound. Oh, okay. Let me take a look at the price comparison chart. Seventy-eight cent or eighty cent cotton. We're seeing four twenty-one for dryland peanut and four sixty for irrigated peanut. <coughs> and that the, that is the other neat thing about it too is that any changes that you make on the front will be automatically incorporated into the charts. So when you click on this price comparison tab and click on the chart, it will show those changes. Any other questions or changes that you would like to make? Okay.
<coughs> so just wanted to um, give you some, of the, some results of an economic analysis of looking at cover crops and supplemental fertilizer. I've only got a few minutes, so um, just to show you the field cover crop treatments, we were looking at crimson clover, hairy vetch, um, rye, and wheat, and a no cover crop control plot. And we also had four supplemental fertilizer treatments of 0, 30, 60, and 90 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And those were side dress nitrogen. It was strip till cotton under irrigation and planted um, during the 2012 crop year. The cover crops were planted in November 2011. Uh, we used for the economic analysis the partial budget approach, um, revenue calculated on yield and the southeast base price for November 2012, which was 69, um, or 0.69 or 69 and four tenths of a cent a pound. Um, looked at system costs on the cover crop and fertilizer, including application of those, and calculated the adjusted revenue, which is the revenue adjusted for system cost and yield. So the revenues may look really big, but we're only looking at taking out the cost <coughs> of the fertilizer and the cover crop because everything else was constant. So just wanted to show you the results by cover crop. In this study, looking at average adjusted revenue again, uh, hairy vetch appeared to be the most profitable um, compared to the other cover crops. And if anyone wants to know about the cost information, I do have that printed out too, if you have any questions on that. As far as um, averaging, the, averaging them over by cup, cover crop, supplemental fertilizer did increase profitability of all of the plots compared to <coughs> no supplemental fertilizer. And just breaking it out by cover and fertilizer, Crimson clover appeared to be more profitable at zero and 90 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Uh, hairy vetch appeared to be more profitable in general compared to the no cover. And then the grass cover crops appeared to be more profitable with the supplemental nitrogen, but there's no real difference between those compared to no cover. Um, actually, there appears to be a revenue advantage to the no cover because they're not paying for that rye in the wheat. So in conclusion for that really quick um, overview of the study, cotton following hairy vetch appeared to be the most profitable um, compared to the other cover crops. There was no profitability advantage of a grass cover compared to no cover like rye or wheat. Um, but there are benefits like reduced soil and wind erosion that should still be considered. And cotton following legumin leguminous cover crops such as crimson clover or hairy vetch may allow for reduced side dress nitrogen applications. So there could be some potential savings there. On the horizon, of course, Dr. Shirley mentioned the Ag Forecast ser series coming up. Registration's $30 for that. You can go to georgiaagforecast.com. <coughs> I've listed all the dates for those. And, of course, we've got the Conservation Tillage Conference coming up. Registration for that is free. And it's going to be February 13th at the Vidalia Onion Research Center. And, of course, we're going to talk about using heavy residue rye to fight weeds and look at the economics of that. I'm planning on presenting some information that Dr. Shirley presented at Beltwide looking at the economics of that heavy residue rye cover in dealing with weeds. So those are for you to think of on the horizon. Any questions for me or Dr. Shirley? This is the website for that crop comparison tool and your county agent also has this link. And they have access to all the budgets as well. Thank you, your fuel. Uh, sure. On, on your fuel. Did you do that same study on propane? I did not, but I probably can. So I can do that and send it to the county agents and then let you know. But I only did it on diesel fuel because they had asked me about 
getting feedback from you all about when is the best time to buy diesel and so I just did it on diesel fuel but that's a great idea. I'll do it on propane too. Any other questions? We're right on time. <laughs>